Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. In 1913, Thomas Mott Osborne, a former mayor of Auburn, New York, spent a week incognito in the Auburn prisons. Shocked by his experience, he determined to turn prisons from human scrap heaps into human repair shops. Today, the Osborne Association operates some of the country's most innovative and effective services for New York State's incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people and their families. Elizabeth Gaines, the association's executive director, continues Tom, Thomas Osborne's mission with creativity and passion as a leading advocate for prison reform. And she's my guest today. Hello. Hi. I love that story of Thomas Osborne. It's, he really was something. I mean, he had a lot of other choices besides going into devoting his life to prison. I think he was the person who kind of coined that phrase, mo they, they, about him, said he was molly coddling prisoners because he had this idea that um, people could be given more responsibility and take initiative. Kind of continues, what we say prisons do is that they take away people's insight, initiative, and intimacy. And, and dignity. And, and dignity, really. Yeah. And um, he had an idea that uh, started this thing called the Mutual Welfare Society. Um, that's probably why they ran him out of Sing Sing after about a he year. He was the warden at Sing Sing. He was the warden at Sing Sing. <laughs> uh, because it's changed his life. He was a wealthy right. businessman right. who decided that uh, he couldn't stand what was going Incredible. on in our prisons. It was. Incredible. So the Osborne Association was formed later. Um, he had actually started it, did. and then it was renamed the Osborne Association after he died in 1931. Yeah. And since then, it has grown considerably in its yes. influence and in its programming and everything else. So tell us a little bit about it. Tell me, what are the programs? The, I mean, the programs are aimed at, I guess there are four or five goals you have. Well, the first goal really is to see if we can divert people from going to prison in the first right. place. So those are what we call alternatives to incarceration. Um, and we go to court and try to talk about what might be possible. If a person's a drug user or has a de developmental disability or a problem, we try to place them someplace else. Um, if they do go to prison, uh, then we go to 12 of New York's prisons and we work on issues like um, HIV prevention, health, uh, parenting, relationships. We operate children's centers in some of the visiting rooms. Um, 90% uh, of the prisoners are men, um, so people forget that they're also parents, but there's 100,000 children in New York who have, minor children, who have parents in prison. So a lot of our services are focused on the kids. Yeah, and we, I mean, you're right that people, Bedford Hills, which is a correctional facility for women, was the first one to have the nursery, right? And mostly women who came, mothers. I mean, in, women, in women's prison, I, I think I heard that their visitors are predominantly women. It's true. Yeah. Um, if you go to the Sing Sing visiting room, which I usually do, yeah. um, it's almost it's just filled all the time um, with women, mothers and daughters children. and wives and children. Um, and you go to the Bedford Hills, and if it's filled at all, it's um, usually with the caretakers bringing their children. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible thing. So you're, you're doing nurturing for the male prisoners in the hopes that they will come out. And you really follow a prison, prisoner when he's getting ready to come out and when he goes out. Right. Our programs begin, can begin really at the beginning of a sentence. Um, you know, we say that we send people, send people to prison to hold them accountable, but there's nothing accountable about prison. You don't decide when to get up in the morning. You're not paying child support. You have no freedom. You, you no, really no are not being accountable. And, and we actually do some work thinking that people need to take responsibility for what they've done. So we work with them through that whole continuum and then as they get closer to release. But our approach is really to work with them as members of families, the men and the women. Because crime, we, we treat crime like it's this individual thing that happened by one person to one person, but it's, it's not. It affects the families of the victims as well as the families of the person who And sometimes the families are also the responsible reason, the, the reason that people are in prison, right? It's that terrible. Because be. there is an, a, a generational kind of thing, I think, sometimes that you want to try to break. I mean, you, well, it's really poverty is what's, yes. is what's intergenerational. Um, one of the problems we've actually had is that a lot of people think that a child 
who goes, whose parent is in prison is more likely to be a criminal, and that's actually not true. Right. And um, our, we've been doing a lot of work with schools and other, um, other places where children go to help kids not be stigmatized just because their parents right. in prison. Um, you know, I was in, uh, lived in Park Slope, Brooklyn, a really nice neighborhood many years ago when my children's father was arrested. Um, they were six and two, and my daughter's play dates got canceled by other parents who thought we must be terrible people. And so it, it really, you know, built in me some real sense that, you know, this could be, it really could happen to anyone. Well, any time I go into Bedford Hills, I think to myself, there but for the grace of God goes, I, I think it is. Yes. Right. I always, the and there's, and there's nothing for, the, at least in those days, there was really nothing for these kids or their families. I was really lucky. There was a psychiatrist in New York, you probably knew, um, Eli Messenger. Yeah. Who helped me understand what my children would need and, and all of that. But for the most part, in most families affected by incarceration, nobody knows what to say or right. do. And they go to school and the teachers right. either don't know what to say or they say things that make the children feel bad. Uh, is that what drew, drew you into this uh, work? You know, no, not really. I, um, I, I, I can't really compare myself to Thomas Mott Osborne, but I was sort of an accidental tourist in prisons. In, I was in law school in 1971 when the Attica Rebellion right. happened. Uh -huh. And I was kind of drawn into prison work totally as an aside. And I think the same thing happened to me as happened to him, which was I was sort of struck by the humanity of the people that I met. Yeah, they were involved. Um, yeah. And I just sort of changed my life course and started doing work around Attica and uh, for prisoners' legal services. So I, I was a friend of Herbert Blyden's. Really? He used to come to visit me. This is after he was in prison. It was so funny. And my mother, of course, was anxious. I was a widow then, and she was anxious for me to remarry. She kept saying, well, are there any men in your life? Herb, <laughs> Herb what was he? He was one of the leaders, wasn't he, he was. in Attica? Mm -hmm. It was really funny, so I used to laugh about it. But, but he came out. He, I didn't perceive that he was a threat to anything or anybody after that. No, and I, most people particularly people like that who really transform their lives um, while they're incarcerated. But we don't, um, you know, we say, we say we believe in second chances, but for the most part, we, we don't. You know, we say we think people can change. Um, and we, we, we bet the farm on it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we go to Weight Watchers and mm -hmm. we marry people that we know aren't, mm -hmm. you know, they're not going to change, right? We have this whole, but People in prison really do change. Something happens, not everyone, and not in every situation. But for a society that says we believe in redemption, we actually don't practice that. And we do also don't really have a program of rehabilitation, generally. That becomes different programs, people like you who provide that kind of thing, isn't it? It's well, not part of our prison plans. I think... I think it's our... I think... I, mean, I, I don't even know what rehabilitation means. Well, that, I think that that's... The question. Part of the, of I think the I'm talking about remorse and the, and the change, but it should be a, a way that it's really encouraged more than I think it is. But you know, more, much more than I do. Well, no, I, I actually think that they that they make a fair effort, but the numbers have gotten so enormous. Um, you know, when I started this work, there were 12,000 people in New York State prisons, and there were 12 prisons, and I'd gone to every one of them. And as I've been doing this, it went as high as 70,000 right. with 70 prisons. It's incredible. So the possibility that you could provide in, enough for that. Services. And you know, Americans have such an appetite for locking people in cages. Yeah, it's incredible. That, was that the result of the Rockefeller drug laws? The, Largely the around the country, um, yeah. the drug laws began to right. really push the numbers. And up. we now have, I think, 57,000 people incarcerated right. in the actually, state. Right. New York has actually led in bringing the numbers down. Yeah. Crime's gone down, yeah. incarceration. But the prisons down. haven't gone down that much. What are they, 67 prisons still in the state, I read? Well, actually, we've closed, we have closed a few, but there's still a lot. And part of the problem that we've been trying to deal with is that they built them in upstate New York, or Canada, it seems like. Um, and they did it as an economic development program for the North Country, and which was mean, ba basically we were betting that crime would keep going up and that people's appetite for locking people up would keep going up because they have no backup plan. And now that the numbers went down, it seems obvious to me 
that we would keep the prisons open that are, if we have to keep them open, that are closest to where people live. One of the things we know is that people who stay connected to their families are six times more likely to succeed when they get out. So the main thing we should be doing is helping people stay connected to their families. Even some of their, like, the little Meshuggah families, frankly, it's still a connection to the world. And, but because of economics, and now, I don't know if you, you followed this, yeah. but they, um, they count prisoners, or have counted prisoners right. in the districts that they were incarcerated. Where they're incarcerated. Right. <laughs> there are several upstate legislators that would no longer have seats if they counted them in their home right. counties. And some places in New York City that would have more. And it's a contentious issue right now up mm -hmm. in the There's state legislature. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a very interesting. Also, the economic dependence on the prisons, because now uh, the governor in the budget, not, he doesn't have to have a commission now, he can do it himself, can decide that he can close, he's going to close five prisons, is that in the budget, they I think? He said five, 3,700 beds. Yeah, yeah. 3,700 beds. So the governor is going to announce shortly that they, which prisons they close. But as you said, it's the economic heart of many communities. And, um, and that brings in the union and all the pressure of that. But it's, you know, it's interesting, the cost. The cost is not only the salary of the correction officers or the number of prisons we have. It's, it's all the things that add on to it. I was reading about the overtime that is done. Partly is that because we have 67 prisons and they're, they're spread all over, so they work overtime? Well, some of the biggest <laughs> overtime is Doc like nurses, nurses and doctors. And because, dentists, yeah. I mean, they, they want them to work in locations where... They, they're so far away. They don't, people don't want to work there. Right. So. And there are so many people that need their attention. And if there's only one doctor in a facility, he's going to be there forever. Well, you know, prisoners are actually the only people in America who have an actual right to health care. Um, so they yeah, do <laughs> have to deliver it. And they don't have people to do it. So if they have a nurse that's a live body, they're yeah. going to keep her around, around the clock busy. if they have to. Yeah, so sometimes they're, they're making $200,000 or more. So all of that costs, and then that affects their pensions. It's never ending cycle, is it? Because the, your pension, I think, is computed on your last three years of a salary, mm -hmm. something. So all of that adds to the costs. And it's, uh, it's an unanswerable question until we find a way, I think, to go back, as you said, to the question of poverty. They, they do a whole um, breakdown by race. And we know that it's predominantly, very predominantly, what, black and Latina, people of color. Right. Overwhelmingly. But have they done the breakdown with, by um, income and economics? Um, they have. I, I don't know that they really talk that much about, you know, sort of what were you making the year before. But yeah. they do ask, the vast majority of people who come to prison were un, unemployed um, on prior welfare. to, so most of them weren't even on welfare. On, Welfare, um, unemployed, working off the books, very marginal, um, fifth grade education. All of which contributed to their committing crimes. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and, and we know that, I mean, the prisons used to only require people to go to eighth grade. They now actually keep people in until they get um, a G, or they try until the, a GED. Um, but if you, you know, the counterintuitiveness of it um, they took colleges out of prisons in 1995 because of upset that Pell Grants were going to undeserving people. But the, the, the uh, recidivism rate of people who have even some college is something like 9% compared to almost 50%, 40 or 50%. So we know that college education is coordinated with people not committing crimes and not going back to prison, and our response is take college out. We're lucky. We now have an education, com I mean, we have a commissioner at Corrections who really believes in it. When he was the superintendent at Sing Sing, they brought college back, and they have a master's program there. Mm. But that is unusual. Unusual. Bedford Hills has a college program. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many others. There's several. Actually, Bard College now mm. has a uh, oh. program in several prisons, uh, Mercy, Manhattanville. It's yeah, but... It it's, it, but so, it's sporadic yeah. it's little. So the college program helps, but we also know that young people who then leave school very early have not had the kind of education that would really allow them to go further, right? And then they don't have a job, and then that, that's just what happens. So do you get overwhelmed by this sometimes? No, because <laughs> um, 
doing what we do, we, we get to actually see people's lives turning around. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's I mean, it, it, if you look at it from more of a distance, it feels actually more hopeless than it is when you're right there. And watching people that are really struggling to take responsibility for their lives, I mean, what, what, what our sort of philosophy is that people live their lives consistently with the future they see for themselves. So we're busy at work with young people in particular, having them see that there's another possible future. I mean, I don't know, I really believe people yeah. change, I how, see it. How do you help them get them jobs, do you? We do. Um, we actually have a green career center right. that's focused on, um, which was funded by stimulus money, and the stimulus money is running oh, out yeah. now, so we have right. to come up with plan B. But um, we felt that even though there are a lot of employment areas that bar people with criminal records, the green sector is so new that they haven't gotten around to that yet. And, <laughs> um, and we feel like, you know, we're sort of in the recycling business anyway. So we've been training people in weatherization and uh, energy auditing and a lot of those new fields that we think that they can be successful in. And they're getting, we're getting them jobs that are way above minimum wage. And we have a whole program of uh, getting people to a janitorial business that pays prevailing wages uh, with benefits. So we work really hard on not just getting people a job, but creating a career pathway, something that starts and that we can keep working with them to really become part of the economy. So how do people in a prison where you don't have a program, what's that their sad lot? <laughs> um, well, you know, I want to put a little bit back on, on them. I, I, think, I think that we kind of diminish people when we assume that the, their circumstances are all that they can That's ever true. be. Um, and, and the truth is that I've, I've watched guys in prisons where nothing is there and they do cell study and they've figured out ways to advance themselves and they'll just be in the GED program. They try to learn skills. So I, I think it's more difficult for them. Mm. But um, I, I think people who make a choice to take responsibility for themselves can do a lot. Obviously, we'd rather see more programs. Um, we think that ours are particularly effective for two reasons. One is we actually partner with the incarcerated people and we actually train them to do a lot of work the with their peers. Right. Um, so the prison um, AIDS counseling and education program, all of the AIDS education is actually delivered by incarcerated men to other men. We're just really there to facilitate that. So I think we yeah. forget that people in prison are right. quite capable. And have, and have time and, mm -hmm. and, the, and the desire to do it. It's a very important thing for them to do. Yeah. But how much, would, how much do we estimate it costs to keep a person in prison? You know, I think they're 50s. saying about, well, in the city it's much higher yeah. in the 60s. I think state prison, the last number I saw was 37 to 40,000. Um, but it's, it's uneven. Per and year. Per year, per person, per year. Um, it's going to go up because we're keeping, in pe we're keeping people in prison for a very long time. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I need to see the doctor more <laughs> now that I'm getting a little older. And we're, not we're, old. we're going to have, we're getting better. Well, we're getting better, <laughs> but they're getting older. All right. um, and we are getting a graying population inside of prisons, a geriatric population that is going to be very expensive. Essentially, we're going to be running nursing homes at three times the cost of a nursing home uh, because we're not releasing people. We're holding people why way are, beyond Why are we the keeping minimum. them? Why are we keeping them? Um, we're keeping them because they w are being treated as if they are still the person they were on the worst day of their lives. We, as I said, we say we believe in change, but we don't. As a society, we're still blaming them. We're not giving them any opportunity to say, and sometimes it's simply ridiculous that somebody who went to prison, there's one of our clients was 19 years old. He went to prison. He was a lookout in a robbery. His co-defendant killed somebody. It's a terrible crime. He's not making an excuse for it, but the judge did not give him the maximum sentence. He gave him 19 to life. He went to the parole board when he was 19, after 19 years, another two years, another two years, another two years. So he's now been in almost 29 years. Uh. And he has a master's degree. He has a college degree. Uh. He works in our programs. They trust him to watch the children in our children's centers. And the reason they give every time they turn him down is the serious nature and circumstances of the instant offense in which he was a non-shooter accomplice 
in a robbery that went terribly wrong, and there's no... And I'm sure there are lots of people with that same kind of charge. Oh, thousands. That's, yes. Thousands. Yeah. And it's expensive, and it's... So how frankly, can we change that? Uh, well, I think that the parole board responds largely to what they perceive the public expects and the public wants. They're, they spend their lives uh, imagining the Daily News and New York Post headline, should they release someone who was sent to prison on a serious case, even if it was 35 years ago. On the chance that they may commit another crime. Uh, well, actually, Usually that. I mean, that's why the papers... That, they say that, but even the people who are, who are arguing that the person should stay in prison, almost never, the, even the victim's families, almost never say, we're afraid of him. It's always, he has to continue to pay. No, what I meant was the pro board person mm -hmm. is afraid if they let them out, the person will do something. It's like that revolving door with Dukakis. You remember that? Who was that? Oh, right. But he let somebody out, and then they, and chances are that will never happen. I don't know. When I spoke to parole board members and I said that this is a public safety issue, yeah. and they said, no, it's a punishment issue. Oh. They're not arguing that it's public safety. They know, some of these guys, they've turned down parole for long-termers who are in wheelchairs. They're not going anywhere. So ridiculous. Um, so how do we change that? Well, that's a public conversation. I mean, we, we, we tell our governor that we expect uh, the parole board to follow the law that says that they would consider what someone's done since they've been incarcerated. We have an, a, another campaign. We, we really are working on behalf of children of incarcerated parents um, who are being punished when their parents are in prison. And we think the parole board should be considering the ability of someone to come home and actually contribute to his or her family. Mm. Um, but so, I think but it's, the all, it's, it's all the, the reason, I mean, it, it all goes down to what, what would be the good that would be from releasing people and, and to consider that, right? I don't, yeah, but I, I think but we could change the legislation. We, we, we can and we should. The Maybe legislation after. should absolutely indicate that once someone has completed the minimum sentence, if they've done what's required of them, um, they should be, and, and they've behaved themselves or expressed remorse or whatever it is that we expect over the course of change of lifetime, should be released. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I think part of the problem is we don't take good care of the victims of these crimes. Right. And so when you hear someone comes up for parole, so and you bitter. hear this, you hear the widow of the person who was killed telling, saying that 25 years later it is as painful as it was, my question is, why haven't we done something right. for the victims? But now there is this now, this instrument for having the victims and, and the perpetrator meet and try to come to reconciliation, right? But New York doesn't have that. Um, it can happen. It happens on very rare occasions, but it doesn't. It doesn't lead to release. Uh, many prisoners okay. would like it. They really have come to understand the damage they've done, right. and they would like to make amends and apologize. Um, actually, they're not permitted to to contact the victim, um, but they can. They can yeah. go to the court. It happens rarely. We actually have a new program. Uh, that we're piloting in um, Sing Sing and in another prison with people who are there for very serious crimes. And we br have brought in victims, um, survivors of homicide, family members, to meet with them, to help them really understand the impact of what mm -hmm. they've done, um, mm -hmm. and to find ways to make amends and apologize. So it is the whole public attitude toward crime. Yeah. It is, and, yeah. and also our perception of the people who commit yeah. crimes. It's interesting how the word, we talked about this before, how the word penitentiary came. Tell us about it. Well, um, you know, it was probably back in the 1600s, there was a thought that when somebody did something wrong, if you put them, locked them in a cell and gave them a Bible, that it would lead to penitence. And eventually they would um, transform their lives. And unfortunately, it turns out that putting people in an isolated place, even with a Bible, drives them pretty much crazy. crazy. So New York um, took a different model when they built Auburn to do congregate care where people yeah. had access to each other. There was other. an article in the paper. I know we, we're not talking about the federal system, but they have now the, the SHUs. What is that? Is it segregated housing, special housing, secured housing? I never know what it is. Uh, but they... They've embraced that concept. Of well, that's just a tragedy because right. the people who are most likely to be in that situation are people with the greatest level of mental illness. Right. We have 
a higher, a very, very high proportion of the mentally ill are incarcerated. Yeah, what, what percentage is, do you think? It's, it's been said to be somewhere between 13 and 30 percent. And they're disruptive within the prisons, too. Well, the population. You know, for some people, the way that their mental illness manifests is yeah. exactly that way. Right. And so their response is to lock them up in solitary housing, which would make a sane person go crazy. And so that's because we don't have the mental health facilities that we yeah, need. New York actually has some, some, good, has some, some very good, good ones, ones yeah. uh, in the prison system. Right. Right. Uh, again, it would be less expensive yeah. to treat people in the community. So how does one contact uh, the Osborne Association? Well, um, our, our website, we, people can uh, email info at osborneny.org, O-S-B-O-R-N-E-N-Y.org. <laughs> And it has all the different programs that you're running. It would say all the programs. And we also have a hotline for f specifically, right. we're doing a lot of work for women now, women who have um, partners and family members in prison, as well as family members. And we have an 800 number, 1-800-344-3314. Uh, and the hotline is answered by people who've been incarcerated or family members and can help other people with that experience um, just sort of figure yeah. out how to better get through that. Go to when, support. When groups. is it in operation? Um, well, it's there's always some way of it getting answered. Mm -hmm. It's mostly during the day, but mm -hmm. if people if leave a message, they, they would be contacted. They would be called back. Well, Elizabeth Gaines, I wish there were um, hundreds of people like you. I think there are. Oh, good. All right. <laughs> That's very good. I'm glad. I mean, I'm I support you fully, and I have the same kind of philosophy. But those people there who don't—that's what we've got to convince, right? Yes, and I know that in their hearts they, they okay. can. Well, and I think we will with your energy and, and uh, passion for it. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.